Thank you for sticking with us. We're going to transition into our afternoon panels. Our first panel is on innovation research, big data, and novel methods. We'll kick off with Aya Liponen from the Applied uh, Economics and Management Department at the Dyson School. And then we have two of our doctoral students from sociology who've been uh, working hard uh, with us who are going to uh, continue on the theme and give some case studies of how you might do social science research with big data methods. Thank you, Aya. Thank you. Thank you for sticking around even after lunch. Um, and thank you, Diane, for leading us in our creativity, innovation, entrepreneurship, exploration for three years. We're ever grateful. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about big data as a kind of a um, object of research. And then we'll transition into the next talk, which is more about what, what opportunities for research big data offers per se. So I don't know if that was clear, but, but you'll, see, you'll see what I mean. So, so I have spent a couple of years now, um, and the ISS project has helped me um, with resources and students to, to start getting deeper into um, data as a, as a sort of a commodity or good, economic good that can be um, built on and combined with other things and sold and traded in, in different ways. So I've been try spending time trying to understand what, uh, what might be, what, might, what the markets for data might look like or will look like and what are the issues there. And I'll tell you about what, <coughs> what, what is special about data as an economic uh, commodity. So you're, there's nothing new here about the, the amazing growth in our capacity to, to capture and store data. And as social scientists, I'm sure you've um, sort of seen and started to, to utilize perhaps um, some ways of capturing behavioral data in digital environments. But there's a lot, of, lot more that you may not have thought about. I mean, there's, there's a lot of sensing going on around the world uh, about natural phenomena or things moving around. Um, in economic systems or production systems and all, all kinds of systems. So there's just a lot of opportunities for us to capture when something moves or something is changed or manipulated. And, um, and so that creates a lot of opportunities for us as researchers to use that data and draw inference about this, that, or the other thing. Um, but it's also an opportunity for various kinds of businesses to try to, try to use that try to draw value out of the, that um, information in the data and uh, build new products or services and all kinds of things. But so that, there's, a, there's a puzzle here, and it's really um, around ownership of data. So data cannot really be owned legally. Um, there's different aspects of data that you can control. So you can keep it secret and not tell any, anyone about it and just use it for your own purposes. And then, then it's a trade secret, and that's fine. You can kind of keep that to yourself. But if you share it or if you sell it, there's very limited legal recourse to try to control what the person who bought it or who got access to it can do with the data. And so there's no formal intellectual property right, basically, on, on observations of data, records of data. There are some rights that are associated with the way you structure the data into your database or or um, laid out on a piece of paper, but that's a, that's a different thing. The individual records cannot be really owned. And so that has led to a lot of controversies around data that we say, oh, I just looked at the New York Times this morning, and there were three things related to ownership of data on the business front page. So this is a really rich area. If there are any budding lawyers or law, law scholars out there in the audience, um, this is a great area to start following. I mean, some of these examples I'm sure you're familiar with. Who owns the data when John Deere uh, puts computers in the tractors that collect information about what the <coughs> farmer is actually doing with the tractor? Does the farmer own it or does the uh, John Deere own it or who owns it? Who can control it? What are the rights of the different parties? So a lot of this kind of revolves around privacy, but there's real business issues related to that as well. So if I share my data, what kind of business can you, can you build? A, um, on that. You're all in, in these data broker databases. Everything that you buy, sell, and do is in a database owned by companies like Axiom that you've never heard of, probably. And then there's the iPhone controversy, of course, of, well, who owns the data inside a, a cell phone. So a lot of opportunities to, to, um, 
to, to study or start looking into these issues in, in law, economics, business, um, and sociology, I think, too, with the privacy issues. But the, the main point is that how can you, from, from my perspective, is how can you um, build or innovate around um, an asset that you cannot own? So how can you sell something you're, that you're, you actually don't own? So we started, started work, so when I'm, I've been working on this with a couple of students here and, and some researchers over in, in London, we started just by sitting down and trying to think through, well, what is data? So what, what exactly are we talking about? What are the characteristics? As far as we classify other types of commodities and goods in the economy, what are the characteristics of data as, a, as, a, as an economic um, good? Uh, thinking of data in terms of sort of observations in a database, if that helps you kind of think about what, what, what we're after here. So it's intangible. Uh, we, have, we have a lot of, we've looked at intangible goods in different uh, ways in different industries. So that's not so novel or different, but, it, but an interesting aspect of data is that it's both intermediate and final good at the same time. So you have an observation about, let's say, whether today that can be valuable per se, will you take an umbrella or not, but also as part of a database or as part of using that observation um, in a, some analytical process to figure out pattern, weather patterns or how weather is related to, <coughs> to shopping behavior, for example. So it can be an intermediate good in that sense and a final good at the same time. And, and oftentimes data are used in a very cumulative, cumulative way. So you um, pull data observations observations from different areas and you bring them together and you analyze it. Maybe you combine the results with something else. And so it's, it's sometimes very long chains of activities or analytics and combinations of data that actually create the most value. So that, that's a one distinction of, of data. And so just kind of summarizing some of the features that we found. I'm not going to go over all these in, in detail, but we found it useful to contrast data against um, content. So we've been thinking about content for a, a long time. Um, but in terms of kind of where digital content has really become more topical has been um, with the digi digitization of music and a lot of entertainment, we've, we've started to see kind of controversies around copyright and how can we own and create businesses around digital content. So I think that's a, that's a useful reference point. The other one, software, we know a lot about software markets and currency, digital currencies are an interesting reference point as well because currency is kind of data, but it has a value, kind of an absolute value um, or inherent value of its own, whereas data is usually valuable only in some context. So there's some differences of how we're trying to analyze um, where data is similar, where is it different from these other um, types of digital goods. And I'll, I'll just mention one aspect where, which we think is interesting to think in more detail is what we call alienability. And that's, um, we refer to the aspect of data where an observation is always about something. So if you write a book, that book can be self-standing or song or whatever. Uh, currency is self-standing because it has that inherent value in it. Um, but data is about something that's outside of the data. And particularly if it's about a person, then it's really, you can never alienate or, or separate those things, the data and the person. And that creates a lot of problems and situations. And it can be about organization, it can be about individuals, about um, some event, but it's always about something. And that's sort of the ability to take the, separate the data from that something is what gives some very special legal uh, characteristics and legal issues to data. Okay, so that's just kind of trying to think through what is data like, what are data goods like, and then just starting to scope how can, what are the ways in which data has been or can be uh, sold and um, traded. Um, there's different ways that we buy and, buy and sell stuff. I can just find someone who is interested in, in my car and then I can sell the car to them, a bilateral transaction. We see a lot of that in the data market. So that's where most of um, private data seems to be, how, how it seems to be traded. You can imagine 
And there are mechanisms that allow one person to just kind of share a lot of data. Often it's not an, a transaction, it's just a kind of a sharing, sharing situation, or it can be many people allowing their data to be used by one party, harvesting of data, which is usually associated with some kind of a barter deal. So you kind of sign some or implicitly sign terms and conditions that say that if I get access to this online information, like Google's information, I give you permission to use my obs observations about me in different ways. So then Google can harvest data about all of us in that way. But in order to really benefit from the explosion of the data, data economy or data opportunity, we would like to see much more um, trading in the sort of many-to-many -many or, or platforms, some kind of a data platform. So it, it has turned out to be really difficult for these legal reasons that I alluded to earlier. Um, <clears throat> you could imagine some kind of a marketplace out there in the cloud where people would make their data available and then customers would show up and they would buy and sell perhaps stuff with, uh, via that marketplace, but the contractual issues and ownership issues and and uh, uh, also kind of variability in the characteristics of the data have prevented people from really doing that effectively, economically, kind of uh, in, a, in a business setting thus far. So we don't see if that's really a viable approach. Just kind of a view into the future. There are some technologies that allow us potentially in the future to, to address some of these security and uh, verifiability issues around data. And people are now uh, seriously talking about blockchains as, as a verification technology that would allow us to trace um, observations from databases, which would allow us to have verified transactions. You could know where the data is actually from as a buyer, and then the seller would know where the data is going and how it's going to be used. So blockchains could be a, a mechanism to it at least in some cases, to enable more sort of a decentralized platforms for buying and selling data. But we're not there yet. That's a sort of a future vision. Um, so that's a sort of the, the kind of the environment in which we're trying to, trying to understand how data can be commercialized and innovated around. And we started doing empirical research by just looking at, well, how do companies actually do this in, in addition to just describing sort of overall mechanisms for, for um, transferring data. So we, we started to collect uh, license agreements. Um, we've looked at open data, so various kinds of websites that make data, open data available, and looked at the terms and conditions, which are implicitly license agreements. So we have about 300 of these now from different kinds of uh, providers, governments, commercial, academic, and, and uh, other. And we look at the uh, contractual features in those agreements. And there's some interesting variation along the lines where you would expect. So it's not all standard and the same. So that's the good news for research purposes. There's variation. And it seems to be correlated with what kind of an entity is making the data available. And as you can, so just um, some, some aspects that we've coded, as you can imagine, commercial entities tend to be much more strict about kind of trying to limit sharing and trying to limit commercial utilization, whereas academics tend to be just kind of throwing it out there and hope, hope you cite me when you use these data is a typical academic approach. And there's um, some variation also um, depending if it's a government or personal. personal uh, so individuals tend to also try to limit the sharing of the data more um, strictly. So there's some variation here and, and uh, this is really, 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 preliminary look at, um, at these kinds of data. So in order to kind of compare different kinds of data, um, in addition to the open data, we're looking at proprietary data licenses. So we have a bunch of licensing contracts from uh, the SEC. It's a small number, unfortunately. Um, but we can at least compare, kind of qualitatively, descriptively compare those transactions, bilateral data transactions against um, other types of intellectual property. So we're looking at patent license agreements and some trademark and copyright and software license agreements as well. So we're trying to just kind of really descriptively take, well, how do people try to sell data? 
and buy data, and how do other, other intangible goods get traded, and what can we learn about? The difference is, um, how is data different economically? And um, here's just a really, really early look at those, those license agreements where we see that data tends to be shorter duration in the agreement. So um, maybe that's a reflection of the value of data. It tends to be more fleeting. So the data might be valuable for just a year or two, whereas patents are up to 20 years. And, and sometimes trademarks can be very long lived as well. Um, they tend not to be so sold on an exclusive basis, uh, but confidentiality and use restrictions tend to be very abundant. So those are the, the contractual uh, terms are the ways that people try to limit um, the uses of, of, the, of the buyer or licensor. Hold on, licensee, sorry. Um, some of the uh, more unique features that we find only in the, in the data contracts um, uh, well, it's not completely unique, but warranties. People tend to say the data are there as is, and we don't take responsibility if your process gets messed up because of our data. And that's rarely specified in the other, other ones. But we um, promise to correct and refund and update and replace the data. As, so it's more of a relationship. So when you license data, there's often a uh, kind of an ongoing relationship where I'll provide you updates as we go along, and if you find any, any mistakes, we'll, we'll correct those. Not happening in these other forms of intellectual property. That's a different kind of a transaction. So they all often are commercialized under a subscription model rather than percentage of sales or flat fee or per device uh, licensing of, of software. But then oftentimes, this is also kind of a unique feature, data um, owners or holders tend to um, require that they can go into the systems of the uh, licensee and actually audit what they do with them. So it's a very intrusive relationship sometimes, particularly if um, that involves personal data. So these guys like Axiom and other um, consumer data brokers, they have very strict clauses about um, fre not frequent, but regular audits with the licensees about what, what, is, what is done with our individual data. It's very strictly regulated as well. So it's just a really early look at what kinds of things we're, we're trying to understand about data. So kind of in the intersection of law and economics and, and strategy and innovation. And just a kind of a quick sort of a pitch as far as um, the next speakers. So <clears throat> this is what we're dealing with. The data contracts, licensing agreements are really tedious documents. And I've had very smart and and uh, uh, really good students who have read through dozens and dozens of these and tried to pull the right information from them. But there's techniques, big data techniques, that would allow me to do this much more effectively. But I don't know those techniques. I wish I knew. So um, the next speakers, uh, Abdullah and Fedor, will talk about their work in dealing with similar kind of administrative documents. And I, I hope that will, as one of kind of a follow up from this theme project, that we could um, start as a kind of a community, learn about those techniques and build some capabilities, learn together so that not everyone has to go kind of alone and, and learn the techniques by themselves and bring that kind of new way of doing social science, at least as far as uh, dealing with administrative documents is concerned. So, so that's, I'll, I'll leave that as my sort of final, <laughs> final um, hope that, that we'll start to have that conversation going forward. Great. Okay, yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.